Lieutenant Governor Guadano. Madam Speaker, Mr. President, members of the legislature, and fellow New Jerseyans, I'm pleased to present to you my budget for fiscal year 2014. The budget continues a journey you began with me three years ago to get New Jersey's house in order, to turn Trenton upside down, to make hard but better choices so that we could put our state back on a path to growth. For the fourth year in a row, the budget maintains the fiscal discipline we need to restore New Jersey. Fiscal sanity has indeed returned to Trenton. For the fourth year in a row, this budget is balanced and it imposes no tax increases on the people of New Jersey. Now, I want every New Jersey citizen to remember just how different things were before we arrived. 115 tax and fee increases in eight years, skyrocketing spending, $13 billion in deficits left on our door by the irresponsibility of the past. We must never take for granted what we've already achieved, reduce spending, new jobs, balanced budgets for four years in a row, and lower taxes. It is truly a new day for New Jersey, because for the fourth year in a row, this budget funds the key initiatives necessary to rebuild our state and restore our prospects for future growth and greatness. It provides a record amount of funding for our schools. It once again fully funds the pension contribution we agreed to in the landmark pension reform we enacted together in 2011. In fact, no previous governor has contributed what we have contributed to our pension fund. This budget triples our job-creating business tax cuts and incentives that we put in place two years ago. It also provides for those most in need, our lowest income families, those with chronic illnesses, and people with developmental disabilities. In total, the budget I'm submitting to you today provides $32.9 billion in state spending. While we are meeting the needs of our people in this budget, we are doing it by spending less than New Jersey spent in fiscal year 2008. Now, let me repeat that for you. Six years later, a budget that still spends less. Where else is that happening in America? See, this is what happens when you have a government that tells people the truth, that makes the hard choices, and that actually manages our government. When we looked around four years ago, we saw New Jersey in dire straits. Remember? Jobs and families were leaving the state. Property taxes had increased 70% in the previous 10 years. The state had increased taxes and fees 115 times in the prior eight years. The budget was in deficit, even though the state had increased its debt nearly tenfold in the prior two decades. Now, we knew what we had to do. The results of the old path of higher taxes and higher spending were all around us, and they were disastrous. As the late, great General Norman Schwarzkopf once said, the truth of the matter is that you always know the right thing to do. The hard part is doing it. Those who are supposed to be responsible for controlling taxes and spending before we came to office fundamentally deceived the people of our state. They said yes to everything. Yes to higher taxes. Yes to more spending. Now, we must not return to that era of recklessness and deceit. Starting three years ago, the people of New Jersey rolled up their sleeves, and we did it. We did it together. 
We knew we needed to get state government spending under control. Together, we recovered from an era of high taxes and high deficits, restored balance to our finances, and rebuilt those things that will contribute to economic health in the future. First, we immediately impounded $2.1 billion in reckless spending by the previous administration and its legislative budget leaders and balanced the fiscal year 2010 budget with no new taxes. We then quickly proposed a fiscal year 11 budget that had real cuts in every single department of state government and balanced an $11 billion budget deficit. Once again, we did it without raising taxes on the people of New Jersey. We also laid the groundwork for better choices ahead. We were able to put forward budgets in 2012 and 2013 that held the line on spending but provided needed amounts for priorities like our children's schools and reformed pensions. Now, the results are clear. New Jersey has turned around and is growing again. I'll tell you what hasn't grown. What hasn't grown is government. In fact, government has shrunk. Today, there are 5,200 fewer state government employees than when we took office. In fact, there are over 20,000 fewer government employees across all levels of government. We promised smaller government to our people, and we delivered. Now, now, the private sector and the private economy are a much different story. They have grown. Since January 2010, New Jersey has added 103,000 new private sector jobs. The last two years, 2011 and 2012, have been the best two years of private sector job growth since 1999. We defeated, we defeated the jobless decade we were left with here in New Jersey through fiscal responsibility and pro-growth tax policies. This budget will help to continue that growth. The budget provides additional tax relief for the engine of our economy, small business. This marks the third year of implementing the bipartisan job-creating tax reforms we enacted together and keeps us on the path to provide more than $2 billion in tax relief to business in New Jersey. And this budget is balanced without gimmicks. In the past, too often the deficit was declared closed one year, only to reappear the next when the Band-Aids were peeled off. No more. The state's reliance on one-time revenues has been dramatically reduced. They made up 13 percent of the budget I inherited from the last administration and the budget leaders in the legislature. Today, it is only 3 percent of the budget that I put before you. We have done the hard work to put us on the path to responsible and priority-focused budgets. And no gimmicks this year means less trouble and better choices next year and in our future. As you know, Mark Twain once joked, always do right. It will gratify some and astonish the rest. By doing right, by taking on the hard choices together, we made our choices better today. Just three years ago, our pension system was in ruins. Governors and the budget leaders in the legislature had been making little or no contributions to the system. As a result, the system was not sustainable. Our police officers, our firefighters, and our teachers were right to ask if their pensions would even be there when they retired. But together, on a bipartisan basis, we enacted needed and historic pension and health benefit reforms. Now, by making modest but important and sensible changes to retirement age and incentives, to COLAs, to contributions from government employees, we saved the taxpayers $120 billion and put the pension system on much more sound footing. And we have continued, under the leadership of Bob Grady, to invest wisely in a diversified fashion, outperforming most other states in America and even most large endowments. So today, our pension system is on a path 
to restored health. So I can say with confidence and some pride that this budget contains a record pension payment by the state. $1.675 billion for fiscal year 2014, the largest pension contribution ever made by the state of New Jersey. This will fund the third year of the landmark bipartisan pension reform we enacted two years ago and on the terms we agreed to. I got one message to those naysayers and the perpetual cynics who refused to fund the pension on their watch and then opposed our reforms in order to protect the moneyed special interests that support them. Our citizens are fortunate that your type of politics in Trenton is dying, and our pension system is alive as a result. It is a key step in showing what can be done if we come together to face up to our long-term liabilities and to address them head-on in a spirit of principled cooperation. You know, we did this on property taxes, too, enacting not only the 2 percent property tax cap, but the interest arbitration reform to make the cap work. And again, the results are evident. In 2011, after a decade of 7 percent annual increases, New Jersey homeowners saw the lowest increase in two decades, down to 2.4 percent. And last year, we did even better. Statewide property tax increased by only 1.4 percent, the lowest in 24 years. didn't happen by accident, it never does. It happened because we took action. We enacted the cap, we enacted pension reform, we capped excessive school superintendent salaries, and we continued. <laughs> Guess some of the people actually pay those excessive superintendent salaries. <laughs> and we continued, even in challenging times, to fund the senior freeze, which we will do again in this budget. It seems to me that our leaders in Washington, D.C., especially this week, could learn something from our example here. Their failure to take on the nation's budget challenges and address the unsustainability of the nation's long-term liabilities is nothing short of inexcusable. It's past time for Washington to get its act together, and that will take two things, bipartisanship and leadership. And unfortunately, both seem missing in Washington today. But here at home, there's still much to be done to improve our fiscal health even more. This year, I ask you to take action on my proposal to prevent towns and counties from imposing user fees to blow through the 2 percent property tax cap. Why not close this loophole? What are we waiting for? It's also time to finish the job with the property tax toolkit that will help municipal governments keep property taxes even further down in the long run. So far, you've taken action on only six of the 20 bills which embody the toolkit. And the public is still waiting for action on Senator Sweeney's legislation to remove barriers that prevent municipalities from sharing services and to once and for all end the practice of six-figure checks for government employees' sick days. The accumulated municipal government liability for this leave in New Jersey is almost $1 billion. It is time to finish the job and enact these needed reforms this year. 
See, these common sense reforms can bring our property tax increases down even further and perhaps even reduce property taxes. But if you fail to act, everyone in New Jersey is going to know who obstructed the solutions to our property tax problems. And while I'm at it, one last word on the subject of taxes. Last year, I proposed cutting our income tax by 10 percent. When some objected, in the spirit of compromise and conciliation, I agreed to the essence of the Senate plan on tax cuts. Then, in a fit of political partisanship, some in this chamber decided to deny New Jerseyans the tax cut they so desperately need and deserve. It's clear to me that on this subject, we simply disagree. You see, I believe New Jerseyans are overtaxed, and obviously you do not. Many of you in this chamber even repeatedly voted for tax increases. So let me be direct with you. I have compromised and offered to accept your plan for tax cuts. You then reneged on your promise to me and the people of New Jersey. Now, I will not shut down the budget process this year to continue this argument. The people's business and our least fortunate citizens' needs are too vitally important in the aftermath of Sandy. But if you change your mind to concur with my conditional veto, my administration will figure out how to pay for this long overdue tax relief. And if you do not, I am content to let the voters make this decision in November. See, we've learned from experience that taking on problems now will leave us better off in the future. We've seen that it works. The first step is to change that old mindset and to change the conversation. And that means putting the people we serve first and then getting down to work. In the past year, of course, our economy has been challenged by Superstorm Sandy. In the face of this unprecedented emergency, we have stood together, recovering, rebuilding, restoring. I want to thank the members of this legislature and our congressional delegation, both sides of the aisle, for their support of the $60.4 billion emergency relief package which Congress enacted last month. We stood firm and we stood together. And now I want to make sure we can move ahead quickly and without endangering resources for other key priorities. So today I'm proposing the establishment of a $40 million Sandy contingency fund for those expenses not reimbursed by the federal government. This will ensure that we can move ahead with maximum speed and that those things that fall through the cracks will not bankrupt our businesses, our families, and our local governments. This will allow us to get back on track with our small business agenda, get them back on their feet without delay. It will also allow us to continue to make progress on restoring key roads and infrastructure regardless of federal timelines. It will help us rebuild the shore. You know, I grew up going to the shore every summer, and I still do. It is the heart of New Jersey. It still beats strong in every one of us. The shore will come back, as I've said, and it will come back stronger than ever. And I'll tell you this. I expect to go to the Jersey Shore every summer for the rest of my life, including the summer of 2013. Sandy cast a bright light on the dedication, bravery, and the professionalism of our first responders. And to each and every one of you, we are grateful. To honor your service, we need to make sure there are some more of you. So in the budget I propose today, a 35% increase in funding to train volunteer emergency medical personnel is included. Our leaders of tomorrow will have more to help them get trained and get ready. We need more voluntary EMTs, and we need to help them get there.
While Sandy is a challenge that has confronted us today, the most important investment we can make for our long-term future is in education. Therefore, for the third year in a row, I am increasing state aid to New Jersey schools. This budget provides an increase of $97 million for school aid, bringing total state aid to education to almost $9 billion, an all-time record for the second year in a row. Despite the difficulties and challenges we have faced, we are setting records in supporting our children in K-12. We need not to turn back from this commitment. And with this budget, 378 school districts will see funding increases, and no district, no district in New Jersey will experience a decline in K-12 formula school aid for fiscal year 2014. So with this record commitment to funding must also come and unyielding dedication to reform. Here too, we have made great steps in these last three years, but our job is far from finished. I have repeated to you my belief that a quality education in New Jersey should not be a function of your zip code, but a product of your hard work and enthusiasm. To make good on this belief, today I am including $2 million to fund a pilot program for opportunity scholarship grants for needy students. Any child, any child in a chronically failing school and his or her parents should have the choice to find a better school, whether it be out of district or non-public. These grants on a pilot basis will show that choice can work, even indeed especially in some of our most underperforming school districts. I've been fighting for three years to end this blatant abandonment of these children and their families, and today, that fight continues. I am providing for $5 million for an education innovation fund in New Jersey to implement the best new innovative teaching models in all of our schools originating in the districts, not in Trenton, including the use of technology and the internet. Now, technology has transformed every other industry in America to all of our great benefit. Let's make sure it transforms education as well for the better. Now, these two initiatives, combined with record-setting support for K-12 education, are part of a reform agenda that must be an urgent priority for this legislature. We must continue to support and fund and implement the historic 10-year reform that we enacted on a bipartisan basis last year. We must also continue to authorize, fund, start, and support our charter schools in New Jersey. Our student achievement ranks high among the states, but it does not rank high everywhere in our state. And we should settle for nothing less than being the very best in education, in innovation, and in achievement, no matter where you live. See, that's the key to a brighter future for New Jersey. Now, in higher education, I am once again proposing to increase student assistance through the TAG grant program. The budget calls for an increase of $17 million in TAG funding. And I am restoring to independent colleges with a $1 million increase in their funding as well. well. The voters also agreed with me last year that we needed to invest capital in our state colleges and universities. For the first time in a quarter century, they voted overwhelmingly to invest in our children's future. We will put to work this spring over $1.6 billion 
in state and private funds to build classrooms, laboratories, and other facilities to grow and modernize our higher education system and make it more available to every student in New Jersey. The correlation between the ability to get a job, a higher income, and educational attainment is clear. So let's make the path to college available to every New Jerseyan who's willing to do the hard work to get there. Now, ensuring a quality education is one means of creating opportunity for the state's most vulnerable populations. But another is ensuring adequate quality health care. New Jersey is a leader in the nation in reforming our Medicaid program. Last year, the federal government approved our innovative and strategic reform proposal, which does right by the people the program is designed to serve. We have taken groundbreaking steps to ensure high quality, cost effective, and comprehensive health care for New Jerseyans by focusing on controlling costs, promoting community-based care, preserving hospital funding, and integrating primary and behavioral health care. For example, as a result of our reforms approved by the Obama administration, instead of having the standard Medicaid program that forces seniors, forces seniors into nursing homes as the only option when they need long-term care, our seniors will now have a choice. They'll be able to stay in their homes, in their communities, while still receiving the services, care, and support that they need. It's simple. We're putting people first, which is why after considerable discussion and research, I have decided to participate in Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. While we already have one of the most expansive and generous Medicaid programs in the nation, including the second highest eligibility rate for children, we have an opportunity to ensure that an even greater number of New Jerseyans who are at or near the poverty line will have access to critical health services beginning in January of 2014. For a single adult, 133% of the poverty level is under $16,000 a year. These folks are consistently among those who need help the most. Men and women who have suffered trauma in their lives, live with mental illness, rely on New Jersey's emergency rooms for primary health care, or those citizens who lack insurance or access to treatment in other ways. Expanding Medicaid will ensure New Jersey taxpayers that they will see their dollars maximized. Federal funding will cover 100 percent of the cost of this expansion for the first three years and then leveling off to 90% in 2020. Now, let me be clear. Refusing these federal dollars would not mean they wouldn't be spent. It just means that they would be spent to expand health care access in New York or Connecticut or Ohio or somewhere else. Now, accepting these federal resources will provide health insurance to tens of thousands of low-income New Jerseyans, help keep our hospitals financially healthy, and actually save money for New Jersey taxpayers. In fact, taxpayers will save approximately $227 million in fiscal year 2014 alone. Now, let me also be clear. I am no fan of the Affordable Care Act. I think it's wrong for New Jersey, and I think it's wrong for America. I fought against it and believe in the long run it will not achieve what it promises. However, it is now the law of the land. And I will make all my judgments as governor based on what I believe is best for New Jersey. That's why I twice vetoed saddling our taxpayers with the untold burden of establishing health exchanges. But in this instance, expanding Medicaid by 104,000 citizens in a program that already serves 1.4 million is the smart thing to do for our fiscal and public health. 
Now, if that ever changes because of adverse actions by the Obama administration or broken promises, I will end it as quickly as I started it. See, because even without the Affordable Care Act, we have continued to work to provide health care to the uninsured, including many thousands of low-income children through New Jersey Family Care. This budget continues that effort by providing a $47 million increase for family care. And our commitment to prevention in health care extends beyond Medicaid. It is across the board. Emma's Law requires babies in New Jersey to be screened for 60 different disorders that can cause serious early health problems. This budget increases funding for newborn screening by $1.6 million so that it can be done at no additional cost to New Jersey's new parents. This budget supports our health care clinics that serve over 1.4 million patients each year. Total support for federally qualified health centers is now at $50 million, an all-time high in state history. We are also protecting last year's significant increase for cancer screening under the New Jersey Cancer Education and Early Detection Program. The budget provides $12 million for cancer outreach, screening, and follow-up services. And this budget provides substantial funding for our hospitals, some $966 million. To maximize our share of federal matching funds, we have reformed the way we calculate distribution so that hospitals are reimbursed finally based on the level and quality of care that they provide to their patients. We are also bringing those with disabilities into the economic mainstream. So since the beginning, my administration has paid particular attention to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental illness. I signed a bill to eliminate offensive and archaic references in our laws and regulations. We have created a central registry of offenders who willfully abuse, neglect, or exploit a person with intellectual disabilities. We have expanded housing opportunities for people with disabilities, and we have made New Jersey an employment first state, which is better for families, employers, and people with disabilities. So today I'm proud to announce that we have settled an eight-year-old Olmstead lawsuit with Disability Rights New Jersey. The suit claimed that New Jersey was not complying with U.S. Supreme Court mandates to allow people with developmental disabilities to live in the least restrictive and most appropriate setting. In response, we have increased funding for community-based services. We've reduced the waiting list for in-home support and services. And we've expanded group homes and supported living options. We all know, we all know, New Jersey's sad, sad history of over-institutionalization. We have institutionalized more citizens than any state in America other than Texas. It is shameful, it is ineffective, and in this administration, it is ending. See, we're allowing people with disabilities to live where they and their families want them to live, at home, in the community, among family and friends. So with that action, the suit is settled. But if we want to continue this progress, we need to do more. So my budget includes $83 million for community placements and services for those with developmental disabilities. See, because some of our worst mental and health issues are related to another problem, drug addiction. Last year I proposed to you that we require treatment for convicted drug offenders. It seems a lot smarter to me to allow those battling the disease of drug addiction the chance to reclaim their lives through treatment rather than wasting away in prison. I appreciate your passing this landmark legislation. I was happy to sign it into law last summer. 
And this budget supports the expansion of the drug court to implement this law, increasing funding by over $4.5 million for drug court activities. Now, however, you failed to adopt a bail reform package designed to keep the most violent sociopathic offenders behind bars while awaiting trial. Failure to put this measure on the ballot is inexcusable. And it has made every New Jerseyan less safe and our justice system less effective. As New Jersey's former U.S. attorney, I know law enforcement. I know how to combat violent crime. Along with Attorney General Chiesa, we have instituted programs which have crime declining, corruption on the run, and thousands of guns off the street with our Attorney General's gun buyback program. Violent criminals on the streets make every citizen less safe and put witnesses to violent crime at risk. Now, if there is room on the ballot for other issues, there is certainly room on the ballot for a bail reform amendment which will give prosecutors and judges the tools to keep violent sociopaths behind bars. Please do not fail our citizens again. How many more New Jerseyans need to be maimed or killed by repeat offenders before we act. Put bail reform on the November ballot and let New Jersey citizens vote for greater public safety for themselves and the witnesses of violent crime in this state. As we all know, as we all know, at the end of the day, a budget is a blueprint for how to move forward. And this is our plan. It holds the line on spending while funding the most important priorities like education for our kids and our reformed pension plan. It encourages growth with tax reductions and helps us rebuild from Sandy. It continues those things that will hold down property taxes. It makes a record contribution to our pension system accounting for 85% of all of our increased spending in this budget. It reforms those programs which help the most vulnerable, encouraging prevention, work, and treatment, even while providing the needed support so all New Jerseyans can participate in a growing economy and a better future. And it does all that while spending less of the people's hard-earned money than we spent six years ago. Fiscal discipline. Fiscal discipline what was needed in this state. Fiscal discipline what was lacking in the four years before I came here. And as long as I'm here, fiscal discipline will define this state. not enough, though. We need investments in growth. We need inclusion of everybody. Bipartisan solutions today, not a return to the reckless budgeting practices of the Corzine years. These are our principles. They are working. They are building a better New Jersey for everyone. I know, I know for some, it is so tempting to go back to the old ways. They'll tell you, let's just loosen the purse strings a little. We could spend more if you let us just tax just a little bit more. But we have seen the result of this approach, and it is ugly. It doesn't work. It is tempting for others to fight over every item on this agenda, to play the old partisan games, to block progress in search of a better headline, to put their political future ahead of the future of our state.
And we know that this doesn't work either. Just look at the results in Washington, D.C. Is that what we want in New Jersey? Do we really want to return to the tax and spend Trenton of the four years before we arrived? I don't think so. Our approach has been to stand up and say what we believe in, to plant our feet on the ground and hold fast to our principles, to fight for what you believe in. But when you see the other side moving a little closer, to recognize that progress and reach out your hand in compromise, to find the answer instead of keeping the issue, indeed to be the answer. See, that requires being willing to act and being willing to lead, not just talk. The reforms we put in place, the investments we make, the discipline we instill may not all yield results this year or in this term, but they are vital nevertheless. They are a part of our obligation to leave state government, to leave New Jersey, to leave this country better than we found it. For these past three years, we have been about results, and we are not changing now. And you know what? The people of New Jersey are better off for it, and they know it too. We have turned Trenton upside down. We have gotten the budget under control. We have begun to address the long-term health of pensions. We have spurred a wave of over 100,000 new jobs. We have taken the steps to hold down property taxes. We have improved our schools at the same time. Let's not stop now. Let's not turn back. Let's not fail to be bold with the challenges ahead. Let's finish the job. The people of New Jersey have trusted us. They have put their faith in us to come together. It's truly remarkable what we've accomplished in these last three years. The state is growing again, but we can make things even better. So let's continue to fight for our principles. Let's work on a bipartisan basis. And let's get to work for the people who gave us these jobs in the first place. You see, we've weathered the worst storm in our state's history with bold leadership, decisive action, and bipartisan cooperation. Here's what I believe. I believe the sky ahead of us is limitless if we just have the courage to stay the course. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the great state of New Jersey.